Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Fruitful Lotus. So I'm calling my channel, YouTube channel, the Fruitful Lotus. Um, I'm also going to take the pen name, the Fruitful Lotus, um, because I want to make an affirmation. Um, you can go through challenging times and come out okay. And I can't say that I'm completely at the end of the tunnel, but I'm certainly affirming that I am approaching. And hopefully sooner rather than later, I will um, be able to look back and talk about, oh, I remember when. Um, and I say all that to say, uh, actually, so today I want to talk a little bit about dealing with um specifically dealing with depression and um, suicidal ideation, or even if it's not suicidal ideation, self-harm. So either through excessive self-medication or through negative internal dialogue or through um, harmful habits, um, hurtful things towards yourself. Uh, and I, I want to deal with that um, because I think it's really, really important. And it's something that I'm working through myself. And I think that so often we feel um, there's so much space between uh, people who are who are suffering um, with regard to um, uh, intense mental illness. Um, so once you get to that point where you commit suicide, there has been a time where you were isolated, even if you were present. Um, and it's isolated in your emotions, like really kind of feeling like... Um, no one else is like me. No one understands what I'm going through. No one can life, you know, my life has to be so different. And there's something so inherently wrong with me that no one can help me. And the only way to relieve my suffering is to die. And that is an intensely scary thing to feel. It's an intensely scary thing to think that someone you love is feeling. And it's, an intensely scary thing to survive. So um, I really want to address it and I really want to talk a little bit about it. Um, and I'm going to be as candid as possible um, without being too personal. Um, so um, let me pray first. Um, gracious and eternal Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, um, Mother, Father, God. I thank you for the opportunity to humble myself in your presence, Lord God, to be a vessel prayerfully, Lord God, that others who who hear this message will hear more of you and less of me. Lord God, I'm just so grateful that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, Heavenly Father, and to be um, to die of the things of flesh and material that he may ascend into higher realms and um, express optimal alignment with you, Mother, Father, God. I am so grateful for the Holy Spirit. I'm, thank you for, I'm thankful for the comfort of the Holy Spirit in my rough times. I'm thankful that the atonement of my sins have ma has made me the best part, the best part of your will, your perfect will within Christ. And I believe that we all are. So Father, I pray that right now you would give me strength and give me the words to speak, that I would speak and encourage people to live in purpose as a means of um, proper medication and treatment, um, therapeutic intervention against any measure of self-harm, any attack of the mind, any spiritual, um, any attempt at spiritual subjugation, because it's, your word says that the enemy comes to steal, um, steal and kill peace. But Heavenly Father, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, that we would experience peace and experience it abundantly, Lord God, that we would be fruitful. So Heavenly Father, make our hearts good soil, Lord Jesus, for the seed in your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And I say, amen. Um, I'm supposed to do this. <laughs> and uh, let me see. Um, I'm going to do a poem. Okay, so I'm not going to sing a song. I'm going to do a poem. Um, so I give shots out. Um, all right, so before I do the poem, I shared on my page, my Facebook page today, um, a clip from Wild and Out, and that's Nick Cannon's show. And one of the reasons why I shared it is because I was like, wow, that is an awesome exercise for MCs. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is, so I'm kind of already going into the. So on page 79 of the Miseducation of the Negro, by Carter G. Whitson, my daughter's saying, he says here, and as much as the Negroes were naturally gifted in music, he did not believe that any expensive training or direction was required. 
We have long had the belief that the Negro is a natural actor who does not require any stimulus for further development. Um, and so it goes on in this particular series of things, he was saying, okay, because the Negro is gifted as a singer and can render more successfully than others, the music of his own people, he has been told that he doesn't need training. So when he was talking about us being successful with regard to media, with regard to music, with regard to artistic, um, endeavors, he said that oftentimes we're not as successful as we'd like to be because we take for granted that, oh, we're just doing what we, you know, we're doing, we're good. And, you know, we have a natural talent or ability but what Carter G. Woodson is saying you still have to practice and I know I you know I will go through phases where I would really really practice and then there'll be phases like usually it has to be something I'm practicing for and then I'll be like oh well I got it and the thing is what I admire and I'm kind of going um what I admire about um about um Beyonce is she is so her work ethic is cr every documentary behind the scenes I've seen on her her work ethic is crazy so from her first solo album to destiny's child i saw some stuff like back in the day um i think uh bet remember um not bet mtv used to do like the making of the videos and so it was like survivor it was baby boy i saw those so when it, she was preparing for her solo album it was showing um, some of what she was kind of going through in order to prepare the incredibly long rehearsals the press tours um and then it shows how she prepares for her shows. So a lot of people see, um, and when she did four, she did a, um, she released an album to uh, a, a, double, uh, a DVD. And so you could see the concert and then you could also see like the behind the scenes. And one of the things you see is like, it's just, from her doing her rehearsals with the orchestra, from her working with the musical director, from her doing the stage settings. I mean, you can see a lot of those things. It's a lot of work that goes into it. Laura Hill talked about the same thing. And she's just like, you know, it gets difficult because when you are rolling with such a large entourage, and she talks about this on Unplugged, she was just saying like how it becomes difficult. But to the shows that we'd like to see, when you talk about for black artists and even Quincy Jones, excuse me bless um excuse me even Quincy Jones um when his on his Netflix documentary he was showing like he was because he actually composes the sheet music because he's basically if you look at um Cab Calloway and you know to be a band leader outside of just being an MD outside of, MD means musical director um, outside of just kind of like coordinating sounds and instruments you are actually putting together you are actually putting together the work, um, actually the music, you're doing the compositions. And so I think that that's crazy. And I think it's amazing. But one of the things Lauren Hill was talking about is that um, Lauren Hill was saying that it, it's, it's just overwhelming because, you know, creativity then becomes contingent on in order to have that kind of backing you have to be continuously producing but if you are producing under pressure just based on meeting deadlines then you lose a lot of the jovial and the funness of it because if you look at um the first album the fujis did translator crew i think the single the single off that was your mona lisa can i get a date on friday and if you're busy yeah would a month I would am I taking Saturday? Yay. Um, and so, and even if you look at some of her interviews right after the miseducation was released, she was talking about how she was just like, you know, when A and R's would come to some of our earlier shows, she was like, you know, they, you know, we doing flips and gymnastics. It was all this. But I think that what she was talking about is that it was young and it was beautiful and it was you know so when she was like by the time the score came out and we going to do an in-store and it's a line wrapped around the corner we like whoa you know we wasn't expecting that and so I think that when you see that and you go, you see the miseducation and then you see her now if you look at her earlier shows when she was with the Fugees you know they had this banter this back and forth on stage that was beautiful this beautiful chemistry she still had that same kind of love and joy in her when she did the miseducation but I think that the success and when you are a solo artist there's no one else like kind of to even like you know get some of that heat it was all on her and I think that that's kind of what it took out of because I've been looking at her performances I've been kind of scouring through her performances recently and I'm just like you know I'm like I need like I need that Lauren that Lauren made me feel like I could do anything 
anything because at that time I was really, you know, I still struggled with my self-esteem quite a bit for a while, um, like growing up because, you know, growing up through the eighties, you know, and, and, you know, the idea was that to be pretty, you know, your light skin, even if you look at videos from the eighties, you, you know, I'm not just doing talk, like, even if you look at any videos from the eighties, it was always most of many of the girls in the videos and stuff were light skinned and whichever way. And so, I mean, B Angie B wasn't, um, really light skin, um, Oak Town three, five, seven. Um, but I just meant that, um, in general, in terms of like, you know, if a, if a brother was really rhyming about a really beautiful girl, she was usually light skinned. And so I grew up like, I had to grow into my skin. I had to grow into appreciating myself. And no, I didn't make it a big deal. And I didn't walk around with my head down all the time. Like, oh, I feel terrible. I'm so ugly. It wasn't that. But deep inside, I didn't feel like I had what it take. I didn't feel like I had the je ne sais quoi or the charisma to just walk up to any brother and be like, yeah, this is me and I'm beautiful. And I mean, I was into college and I still struggle with that. I still feel like if there's if there's even a hint that someone really attractive would like me, I'm like you would like me? Like, why would you like me? You know, and not because I think I'm so, I mean, I don't know, because I recognize that I have virtues. I recognize that I have skills. I think that I'm attractive. Um, but the minute someone tells me they're interested in me, I'm like, there's no way he could be interested. Well, actually, I can't say I know why. I went through a divorce and I still am repairing a lot of cognitive distortions I developed because of that. And, um, went through some pretty unhealthy relationships and I have to repair it. And I have to, you know, mindfulness is a very real thing. And so, um, dealing with needing to be more mindful and deliberate about my thoughts, what I think, what I allow to be imparted into me. Um, and so, um, one of the things that I really wanted to kind of address. So when I'm talking about self-harm and really trying to make sure that you, push yourself beyond it um, is so when I look at Lauren Hill and you listen to the unplugged album and she's kind of crying and she's going through it and I still think that she grieves I think she grieves the loss of the innocence of hip-hop and the innocence of her hip-hop experience or her experience in hip-hop and I think that that's what she's grieving because if you see her her whole disposition. Yes, she's gotten older, but her disposition has changed. Like if you look at her, like um, I posted this video of um, Carlos Santana and CeeLo Green. And when you, um, when you look at her, like, dem like she looks so happy. She looks so happy. If you look at all of those older performances, it's like she was in her element. And now you see her and she's kind of like, she's still directing the band and, you know, she's kind of still, and I mean, some of it, yes, yeah, she's a mother and she's had, you know, numerous children and her responsibilities have changed. So I'm certain her, the amount of time she can rehearse has changed. Um, I'm certain she's managing a whole lot of other moving parts that she wasn't managing before. And on top of that, like having had, you know, someone question like her authenticity as an artist in terms of like, are you true to the game? Are you just kind of selling out or whatever? And I think that all of those things can take you because then you become guarded and the Bible informs us that we're to guard our hearts. And so um, when people kind of come, come down on her, I mean, and I don't know if it's, you know, different people come different ways or whichever way, but I just think it's important. And sometimes we don't realize how our critiques can impact other people. And so, especially when you feel like, yo, hip hop was mine. Like, that was my thing. You know, if I was upset, like if you listen to her, like one of the interviews she did, and I'm sorry, I'm all talking long, but one of the interviews she did, she was like, um, I remember going to sleep with my little, she had 45s uh, record, so vinyl records. Um, she was like, I remember if I should lose you. I think I, did, I messed up the melody. My friends would all laugh and say, we told you so. You'll break my heart. So it was this old song. Um, and I don't even remember, but I remember her singing it. And so she was like, I would go to sleep and I would lay on the floor with it. And I would just listen to it and play it over and over and over again. That's what music do. That's what music does. Sorry. That's what music does. Music will do that for you. It'll, it'll get you so entranced 
and what it is. And it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. So I think to have that compromise by business and legal ramifications and tax taxes and all of this kind of stuff like that, it can really, really take a lot out of you. Because I look at myself, I was um, reviewing my bio last night and I remember redoing that bio. Um, I have a business plan and I remember redoing the bio and I was doing it for the business plan because I was like, at this point, I'm like, I have a daughter. I don't have nobody to really watch her. My mother died right after I had my daughter. I was like, I don't, I can't be going out doing shows if I don't have nobody to watch the baby. Me and my daughter's father, you know, weren't uh, seeing eye to eye. And he basically, you know, so I was just like, you know, one of the things I can still do is maybe use it to really, um, teach with. And so I was trying to focus on my experiences as a student and as an educator to say that I have a relatable, I can relate. And so, but I was looking through it and I was just like, man, you know, I really, um, I remember just kind of at first feeling like, cause I, I was in magnet music programs and I grew up, you know, and let me apologize if it made it seem like I remember I'm Prince played numerous 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 instruments he's um he is a musical genius no one can take that away from him at all not me nobody 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 but i was talking with somebody and, and i have this thing like you know everything we're accountable for everything we say but and it wasn't nothing at prince i was just saying like i was like yeah i played a lot of different instruments i didn't master any of them prince mastered them my my band director may just be like okay all right, you know, from violin to viola, that's not really a big change. Um, from clarinet to bass clarinet, that wasn't really a big change either because it was the same basic notes. If you, you know, if you get the hand positions, you know, you have to use your thumb to hit the high notes. Um, the, you know, being able to use the reed, not split the reed, having the proper embouchure. Those are basic things, you know, that it's not like, I mean, I'm not trying to say it like that because I don't even think I could play anymore, but um, it wasn't like it was like, oh, I'm so talented that I went between those instruments. And then he tried me on cello, too. And so, you know, with string instruments, it's really just your finger position is understanding how to slide down the strings and, and go up and how to hold the bow properly. That really impacts, you know, the quality of the sound as well. So, you know, and I play piano. So for those things, I was just saying to somebody, I was just like, you know, it's not really, you, you know, you hear a lot of people say they play a bunch of different instruments. I was like, I could say I played all those instruments, but I didn't really master. Like I, I did okay. I mastered the clarinet, not necessarily the bass clarinet, but the clarinet I did do pretty well on, but I haven't played it in so many years. I can't really remember my piano pieces. Um, I had to memorize and I mean, in music theory and stuff like that. I say all that to say I was saying it and I think that people think like that was like throwing shade at Prince and I definitely was not <laughs> at all. Um, I really respect him as an artist and respect his mind and everything else like he's an absolute musical genius. I remember Under the Cherry Moon came out. And my mother was like, uh, you cannot see that. You would not watch that. We were little and they were, they were like, because it, it was I guess it was like the premiere coming on. She was like, that's for grown folks. That's not for you. And um. <laughs> So uh, this, I mean, I, I remember. Um, and I, so then I always wanted to know, like, well, and then when I got old enough to see it, I was just like, what? I don't think it was as bad as, I mean, I don't know. But my mother was like, no, that's grown. And, and I think he presented this such sensuality in terms of his music and in terms of him, his self. Like, he was so in tune with who he is. I saw him on a, um, he was, I think, the Dick. Van Dyke show. Um, I saw some old footage of him on the Dick Van Dyke show, and he was just so like, <laughs> like my words are a blessing to you, and I share them as I choose. So I feel like he just had like such a strong sense of self that you know you don't come across often. And for him to have been so young, I think that particular one he was like twenty, and I think he had gotten an opportunity to get a record deal, but they wouldn't let him play all his instruments. They, they he was like he was like well because they wouldn't let me play all the instruments on my own music. They wouldn't let me, and he was like so I had an issue with that. And I think that you know for him to be so young and so in command of his his vision, his artistic vision, I think it was amazing. So what is what does all that I have to do with anything? If you look at Lauren Hill and you see, um, and I'm not just using her, I look at myself. Let me just, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, um, let me look at myself. So today I was having a particularly challenging day, a really, really challenging day. And I was really trying to push through my emotions. 
But for me, I cry, I'll cry. And so I was just like, oh, God stop crying then it'll come back again I'm, then, then you know I'm trying to find things to do and so then I was just like you know God I need you to help me I really need you to help me work through it because when it you know what I've been dealing with recently is is really starting to feel like man does my life really even have value I'm like because I seem it feels like I've been going through this for so long that the fact that it hasn't stopped must mean that I've been forgotten about. And maybe I'm not the righteous person I think I am. Maybe all of this stuff isn't true. And maybe I need to kind of rethink. Now, I post also, I post meditations that Russell Simmons does, um, that he does. I didn't even realize he was as deep into yoga as you know, he was, I saw a little while ago, um, I think he had Amber Rose at his house. I don't even know what it was on. It was like, must've been MTV or VH1. So this is years and years and years ago. This is probably a good, maybe 10 years ago or something like that. Maybe not 10 years that I saw it. And he was talking about being vegan. He was really advocating, um, uh, plant-based lifestyle. And I, and, and even at that point, I still, you know, um, because Beyonce had done come out and said that she was going raw and vegan for a while. There were a number of artists that was talking about. Now, see, even before all of them, Deb Prez back in 2000, like, I think the album came out in 99. I got it in 2000 on Let's Get Free. They had this item, um, um, be healthy. They had this song on their album called Be Healthy. And it was just talking about let your food be your medicine, no et cetera, and since um, simply herb in the race from the sun because I got melanin. Drink water eight glasses a day because that's what they say. They say they, they say you are what you eat. So I strive to eat healthy. My goal in life is not to be rich or wealthy because true wealth comes from good health and wise ways. We got to start taking better care of ourselves. Be healthy. And so, um, that was a um that was one of the songs and so I remember and, and during that time a lot of the people I was connecting with were vegetarian and vegan and raw and so it was this whole thing about you know it's healthier for you and I know here recently I haven't been making as healthy life choices. I mean some things I've been doing I've been kind of like straddling the fence a little bit um based on budget and what I could afford and um and I could still afford to make healthier choices, but I start worrying because I, you know, I, I still want to work out and I was getting really fatigued um, and I haven't worked out. And so um, I've been a bit transient in terms of my living situation. And so for a while I was eating McDonald's almost every day and I was only doing like cookies and um, like eating like the cookies and soda stuff that I would like soda. I don't, I'll do a carbonated water, but I don't do soda and you still got to watch out because the carbonated water has like aspartame in it. Um, some of the brands have aspartame in it and that's like an artificial sweetener that can really do damage to your body. So um, I was eating stuff that I know I shouldn't be eating. And the more and more I ate it, the more anxious I got, the more depression I was dealing with and everything else. So there is a direct correlation between the things we put into our body and how our body responds. So that's one thing I want to say. So when you start feeling like you like one. And so, yeah, I, I went off on this whole tangent. I was trying to talk about Nick Cannon's show. I was saying like, OK. So I could tie back in. So like when you start feeling those thoughts, there are a couple of things that you can do. One, watch your diet. Try to detox. Um, because I'm telling you, like the more chocolate I eat, the more anxiety attacks I have. Chocolate definitely gives me anxiety. And it could be the milk in chocolate um, as well. Um, because anytime I dairy. I just, I can't mess with it. Um, so I do coconut milk. Um, and I did, I was trying to do soy milk. I couldn't, I couldn't stop being able to have that either. So I just do, um, I use my coconut milk. You could get, Silk has a brand. A couple other brands have um, coconut milk. Flax milk, I found that it's kind of, it's good in terms of estrogen. If you have depleted estrogen stores, but it's a challenge um, because estrogen also neutralizes the enzyme that breaks down histamine. And that can lead to more um, anxiety and uh, almost like allergic responses to um, allergic responses to foods that you are commonly able to eat. So you want to be able to be mindful of that. So um, that's why I do coconut milk um, and it's f f filled with good fat, too. So um, healthy fat. Um, so that's that. So any other thing? So I need to encourage you. So. You want to do those. And then I want to tell you this. We are therefore Christ's ambassador. And so this is 2 Corinthians 5 verses 20 to 21. 
We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So why is that important? The righteousness of God is the best part. So when her and Daniel Caesar has that best part, when you think about it, it's the sunrise against your brown eyes. Um, it's the best part. It's those, it's those little things that you cannot even name. And that's what we are to God. The best part, because when Jesus was resurrected, he was exalted even above the angels. And what he did, why was he exalted? Because he found his anointing. He operated in his anointing. He found his purpose, operated in his anointing, the anointing that God provided as a resource for him to live out that purpose. And then he, and then he, he took it all the way. He, you know, he pushed it all the way to the limit. You know, Rick Ross pushed it to the limit. Um, my home, um, his brother I went to college with. We're cool. Um, brother, uh, brother friend of mine, he had it on his Instagram page. He was doing push-ups to it. And so yesterday I was trying to do my workout and I was trying to get motivated to do it. And, and you know, the, the song Push It to the Limit, it's a sample. Um, it was an, um, it was in Scarface when he started really getting money after he had, um, after the whole, uh, issue with him and Frank had been resolved. Um, well, actually it ain't been resolved. It was what it was. And I mean, it was resolved because, but it wasn't resolved positively. And, you know, he get money and he's back and basically he had been connected with the dude in Columbia. And so the whole thing was during that time. So I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying that that's, I'm just saying that that's what the song like I remember the first time I saw Scarface I was I was about I was young I was really young I, I was in the sixth grade um and I watched it a lot I watched it several times and I remember that that's all that's all every time because that's on push it to the limit dun, ba, ba. And, I mean Rick Ross sampled in like bum 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 Bum, but push it to the limit, da da da, like that. And so it's like it's just dope. Um, I love it. I love the sample. And so you know, on his Instagram page, like Kevin just like he doing push ups, and they like he him and his uh, I guess his workout um his workout partner or uh, uh, either the person he training and the person training him, they just going like and they're going for like a good like. I know I watched like two minutes, like at least a minute and a half into it, at least I'm thinking. And I mean, I ain't look at the clock, but I'm like, yo, they still going. I'm like, I could do 20. I could get 20 out. If he could go that long, I could get 20 out. And so I put the push it to the limit into my little playlist, my workout playlist. So, you know, every time I see it, that's what I hear. So, um, yeah. So when you start feeling sad, working out is important. Remember, you're the righteousness of God. That means you were the best part. You are absolutely the best part. And I remember going, you know, I remember feeling, and this is going to be longer than 30 minutes. Um, and, you know, if you have to tune out, um, definitely tune out. But um, I think that one of the things that is, one of the things that gets me when I have those moments when I'm feeling like particularly when I'm feeling particularly challenged <clears throat> and those feelings, because what, what pushes me toward the suicidal ideation or, and not even that I would self-harm or I would act on it because I don't think that I would. But what pushes me to that point is when I feel like, yo, does anybody care? Like, does anybody hear me? Like I am in this thing by myself. Like it's really hard and I don't really know I don't really know when it's going to end. I think that that's the thing. It becomes like, like, you know, it's almost like being on a deserted island, like cast away with um, Tom Hanks. And you kind of like, at what point are you coming to deliver me? Like, God, yo, you said it. Or look at how long David had to wait. Samuel had appointed him and told him, you know, these great things are going to happen, but he had to wait. So, you know, there's this song, this gospel song saying like, praise him in the middle. So when you take a praise break, when you start feeling like there is nothing you can do, excuse me, when you feel like there's nothing you can do and you're feeling severely, severely depressed, one of the things you want to do is start pushing it to the limit. So that means push it to the limit with your praise, push it to the limit with your prayer. And I'm not telling you it's not going to, yo, when I tell you it feels so freaking uncomfortable, it really does. And so I'm not telling you like you're going to do it and it's going to be easy because, you know, sometimes you see people once they've gotten through it and you feel like, yo, you know, they're not crying. You know, they look excited. They look like this. Like, depression don't look like that for me. 
And some people hide it better than others, you know, um, because a lot of people want to know I was depressed. I was depressed for years. I was, I mean, like crying. And I mean, I realized I have bipolar. So bipolar is different. I, I swing between um, episodes of mania and um, I'm being healed from bipolar. I swing between episodes of mania and depression. So a lot of it is like when I'm manic, I don't sleep a whole lot. And even now, like me trying to control it is saying, okay, I can meditate or I can lay there. I can breathe. There's some things that I can do to really help me through it. But sometimes, you know, I don't have the presence of mind to do that. Sometimes I really just like, I want to cry because I want it to be over. And it don't seem like it's ever going to be over. If It seems like the more I'm pushing and the more I'm fighting, the harder it's getting. So God help me to understand what it is that I'm doing wrong so that we could just hurry up and fix it. But see, it doesn't work like that. And it's a process. And so you have to work at it. And in the middle of it, it may seem like it don't make sense to nobody else. And some people may feel like your coping mechanisms, your strategies are like, you know, hedonistic or you doing this or you doing that. But you have to do whatever you need to do to pull yourself out. And once you get out, you will see, like I was saying, I shared this video um, uh, Nick Cannon show, Wild and Out. And it's like, uh, drop it. It was like, uh, drop it or pick it up or something like that. And so they are freestyling basically. And whether it's freestyle or whether it's um whether it's improvisational, because I think freestyle is like literally off the top of the dome. I think improv, you can have like an idea. So as long as you have an idea, you could be going through in your mind, like they say Jay Z really don't write a whole lot. Like he don't write no more. He just go into the booth and like just speak. But he's written, he's had years and years where I'm certain he had journals that he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote in his early years. And the more he battle rap, the more he memorized, there's certain punchlines, there's certain things. And then after a while, it just becomes a natural thing to create and think in a particular way. Like he's trained his mind from practicing over and over and over again. He's trained his mind to think and process information in a particular way. So you give him a theme, he's automatically about. And I remember I, I got a rhyme and dictionary and I used to read it just to figure out how words rhyme and I and I saw a couple of videos with Idris Elba and he was talking about the Cockneys in London and they basically speak in rhymes so it's like um he was like if it's a coded language he was like so you might want to say you might be a mixed company and you don't want them to know like this one particular I saw just the other day he was like you may not want them to know you going up the stairs what rhymes with stairs hair so it's like go to the hair um like go over there uh um, there's a hair. I'm about to go to the hair where the fairs are. I'm about to go to the fair where the hair is. And so the person speaking, I guess you all know that that means I'm going to the stairs. That may not have been the best example. I'm sorry, but that's basically what he was saying. So you practice rhyming. So I say all that to say what the amazing thing was, and I've seen other, I've seen other MCs do it. Where one of the ways to keep your skills tight, especially in terms of freestyling. They just will hold stuff up. And as they're holding stuff up, you have to include it in your rhyme. So you know that they're freestyling because you don't know what they're going to It could be anything. And, he, you know, it's, he could be grabbing stuff. Jason Nichols used to do this with this brother he used to rhyme with. Um, and, you he, you know, anybody in the audience could give him stuff to, like, hold up. And the guy would rock, put it into his rhyme. And so those are all ways when Carter G. Woodson talks about it's not just about having a natural gift or ability. You still have to work at it. And so I think a lot of times hip-hop didn't get the um, hip hop um, MCs don't get the respect that they deserve because people don't understand the amount of work it goes that goes into actually developing your craft and actually being good. So I could call myself a lyricist, but you know, I really, um, I really, to me, to be called an MC, that is a, um, and I've written it before, and at that point, you know, I was pompous because to be an MC is an honor that is bestowed upon you. You can be a lyricist and you can be good, but to be an MC, you have an MC that can move the crowd. You might move the crowd, but you're not an MC. An MC is being true to the element of hip hop. That means you uplifting. That means you are mastering the energy in your cipher to then encourage the energy in someone else's. It means that you are challenging yourself to develop lyrical content that is responsible and culturally relevant. And this is my definition. Um, and it also means that you have a, a reverent respect for everyone who's come before you. So it's not just about being able to move the crowd. It's, it's about being able to say, you know, 
I can move the crowd with lyrical content that's relevant and I can make it lively and I can make it awesome and I can do all of those things because it's my purpose. It's a divine inheritance. Um, that's so I, I can't explain it in any other way. And so um, I think that those things are important. So why is that? Why do why does that matter with regard to um, mental health? What was my point? I was saying practice it. Like anything else. If we also don't take mental health, a lot of mental health serious. And the thing is, a lot of times the concern isn't when people are talking about it. Because when they're telling you, um, I, um, you know, I want to hurt myself or I want to do these things. That's, you know, at that point they have the presence of mind to tell you that something's not right. When it gets to the point, and even then, you know, that's certainly a red flag. But when it gets to the point when they stop talking and you don't necessarily or you see like these staunch changes in their behavior, whether it's like major changes in their hair, major change, you know, they start giving away stuff and doing all kind of things like that. You know, sometimes, sometimes those are indications and sometimes it could just be like, yo, I'm letting go of this life and I am moving into something different, you know, or whichever way. Not to say that makes it better or worse. I'm just saying that, you know, sometimes it's that. But you just want to pull close. And I was telling, I was saying something to, I was talking to somebody one day and I was basically saying like, I was talking to someone today and I was just saying like, yo, um, I was like, there's this episode of Sex in the City and Charlotte has gotten some bad news. And so she's kind of walking, you know, she went to the doctor. She didn't want anyone to go with her, but she wanted, um, but she came back and then she was walking and they were basically her, her friend, instead of like, like pressing her, like, I'm going to be there for you or whatever. She was like, I can understand. And so she let her walk and she just walked behind her all the way home. And, um, I think there was a similar episode on soul food where bird, this is like season two, episode one, you know, and there's some issues going on and bird has to go to the hospital. And, um, it's like when you have that person who understands how to allow you to have space, but then still be present. Because sometimes we'll say it and it's not about contradicting ourselves like, oh, I don't want you to be here. But that's the time when I probably need you the most to hold me and I need you the most to tell me. And it can become difficult, you know, for other people. And they're like, I don't understand what you're saying. You're saying this, you're saying that. And I think to have that kinship where someone can say, I know when you say this, you like, like, um, 112 has this song. It's like, Cupid doesn't lie. And he's like, um, girl, if I tell you to trust me, that doesn't mean that I'm going to cheat on you. And it's just like, I need you to understand that, you, you know, and I think that the beautiful thing about it is, um, and I know Puffy just had a birthday, um, is that it's not just about like it's that in those moments when I'm saying, you know, I don't know that my life means anything, you know, it's not attention seeking. It's more so me saying, like, tell me that I value, tell me that I'm valued. I make mistakes and I know I may make you angry. I know I may make you feel like you don't want to ever talk to me, but tell me, tell me that I matter because I do. And so, you know, for folks that may be going through depression, I just want to encourage you to know that you are loved and you are the best part. So even if you don't hear it, because that's the thing, you got to know that even if you don't hear it, you are, you are worthy and please do not give up. Please do not give up. And I'm talking to you and I'm screaming to myself because I know that there are times when I literally feel like, man, I don't know if I'm going to pull through it because it's really hard. Even the solution seems hard. The challenge seems hard. The solution seems harder. So renewing my mind and not doing what just originally comes naturally, what I feel like I immediately want to do in any given moment and being able to say, OK, I can control my impulses. I don't have to behave in this way. I don't have to respond in this particular way. That's the challenging thing. So. Um, so I'm going to read a poem. And. Um, so this is. This is. 
where are we going to start? Um, so this one is called Release from Lonely. And of course I wrote it. Um, Under rocks and in caves, might I find the courage to trust and believe in the goodness of mankind? Prophets and saviors teaching of truth. God designs. God designs from mountain. God designs from mountaintops to ocean floors, leaving pearls for the righteous to find. Spreading seasons across the skies and lava at the earth's core. Hurt seems to hurt deeper when completing the inevitable chore of debreeding the dirt and residue unkind collected in the throes of war. It gets ugly though love is blind. Spiritual and ethereal attacks on the mind. Legion believes itself eternal, but it's a demon, unwanted guest, a stowaway pain in the spine. It must be dispelled, pushed under the feet of those striving for God. The Holy Spirit's work will be complete by, by staff and with rod. Patiently rebuke the disorder of Nimrod, any manner of confusion that in fruit we refute. You are holy, righteously filled with true mercy. Yours is an ever-flowing well for all for all who are thirsty. We are worthy for the preservation of substance, with, um, substance within, never alone, for Christ is a constant friend, present and comforting, even though we are imperfect and perpetually sin. It just means I am one of many, regardless of skin. Sometimes my heart feels so heavy, it seems no love of mine can ever be steady. To express balance, though I think myself ready. To live as one on, on the team, God is begetting. Just get me through this season of filters and emotional vetting. I like to love again. Trust a man with his whole heart. Trust a man with this whole heart, of, with the whole heart of mine. With this whole heart of mine, but then strongholds start creeping up, searching for a wrinkle in time. Faithful, please be faithful to me. If you, if ever you believe me worthy of position, be it friend or family, I'm holding on, believing there is love left to find. Forgive me, dear Father, if I have ignored the obvious signs of mercy, grace, and favor. I must always speak. Change me, dear God, to overcome the faults that make me weak in faith, fruit, or purpose. Drive me closer to a seat next to you, close to you in spirit and in deed. May God always be a provider and I, a covenant keeper, born to master my beliefs, help me abide in purpose that my fragrance will grow sweeter. So some of these, I mean, I'm reading it just now. I saw more edits that I need to do. So and and so there's work to do. So I know a lot. I wrote all these pieces and I really didn't sit down and um, edit them. I just kind of wrote them and just said, oh, that's that. And the other thing. So I changed the, the title to of my poem I did yesterday. Um, you might not even be watching these in order, but I put another one up and it was like um, something like what La Wale wrote for his ambitious girl. So I changed it to diligent man like Wale's ambitious girl. So the idea is that, you know, he was writing, you know, basically outlining the attributes of his dream, of his dream lady. And so I would want a man that diligently seeks after God because he all things will be added unto him, just as I should be diligent in my pursuit of God as well. So the other poem I wanted to do is called uh, Christian Aquarius. And it goes like this. I've become acquainted with madness, but I'm fighting its emotional discontent so that I can grow from the associated challenges. It's uncomfortable doing the same things repeatedly while making only slight adjustments to exact the sweet spot for optimal processing of submissions and extractions from the Akashic record, but it's work that must be done. How deep can one fall in love with self before drowning in narcissism? How high can one fly before burning a wing in solar flux and galactic waves of heat? How do I open my day if my limbs are tied to a need to earn acceptance by more conventional means of productivity? How can I get out of the box if I'm not first able to define its boundaries, vulnerabilities, and the form of the devious architect who tried to hide them? These are scientific ponderances, hidden in philosophical exigence, often discredited as valid because the proof is in the pudding instead of variables and methods. Now I'm perplexed. My body does not easily digest the contents of pudding, and although I enjoy it, although I enjoy it, so what must I do if the investigation of such pertinent query is in a way indicative of self-harm? If I journey away from the inevitable pain, does that make me a coward or human or a spiritual baby failing to thrive in its purpose because the projected outcome is contrary to natural function? Well, like chairs and others in that and other inanimate objects, we must sometimes operate outside of our established function in order to serve a purpose that is much more critical than our design in any given moment. 
At times, our mental faculties must conference out loud and attest to this fact in order to compel us to use the executive skills that earn us the title of boss in our own right, that we may demonstrate authority over our carnal self and circumstances. But then again, spontaneity is not easily followed. So is being, so is being a boss the same as being a leader? I don't know. And such questions seem odd when asked. So should I ask? So should I speak or remain silent when the dissonance in my cognition starts pounding the pave to Calvary with pounding the path to Calvary with Benjamin's cup in the hand of Christ, realizing that rejection can be acceptance turned inside out over a few generations? O oh, Israel, what have I done to deserve the mercy and favor of revelation? I must now apply what has been revealed to in intentionally renew my mind, a refreshing concept that requires me to get dirty in the wilderness before I can appreciate the subtleties of its flavor. God, please prepare my palate to enjoy communion in the new skin of a more righteous attitude so that even the gourd of my fruit will be su a suitable vessel to draw water from your well so that your promise of etern eternally flowing water will be suitably evident in my work and rest. So um, this particular piece, I was kind of like dealing, you know, working through anxieties, working through some challenges, and then also looking at you know, what does it mean, like, to, um, what does it mean to to be a water bearer? So I'm actually an Aquarius. My birthday is January 27th. So the water bearer, you would think it's a water sign, but it's actually an air sign. And so when God talks about water and the living water and that we would thirst no more, the idea is that, you know, water, you know, the body, I think, is three fifths water, you know. Um, and so, our body. I saw this thing. Um, this uh, did this study. This uh, uh, scientist did this study, and it was saying like the impact of words. It says like the words actually can change the shape of the molecules in the water. So the things we speak over ourselves, the things we listen to, the things we hear, even if it's inadvertent. That's why we have to protect our eye, our ear gates, our eye gates. You know, govern our tongue you know, with mindful speech and be deliberate about everything we say um, because it definitely can change our mood. It can definitely change um, the way our body processes the world, you know, whether it be through worldview, perspective. Remember, the, the brain is a muscle. It's an organ and it's a muscle, just like everything else. And you have to lift it. You have to lift it and challenge it. And because it's easy to just speak impulsively and do whatever you want to do. Now, there's a difference between speaking impulsively and speaking extemporaneously or freestyling. So to be impulsive is just to say the first thing that comes to your mind. To speak extempor extemporaneously is to speak from a theme with, you know, calculated sentiments, although they may not be planned. All right. So that's the difference. So we just want to make sure that we're working through that. And and so in, in, in with that in mind, being aware that intrusive thoughts are so real. And, you know, you have to be able to know when it's the difference between having an intrusive thought and when it's your intuition. Um, the origin will be determined by, you know, what does it tell you to do? Is it leading you closer to God? Now, Again, it said God made him who had no sin to become sin, that he may be that he would be made um, had no sin. He had no sin and he became sin in order to be the perfect sacrifice for all of our sins so that we would be atoned. So it's important to know that all your sins have already been paid for. Your house, your body, your temple has already been paid for. And you can proclaim it and you can profess it. You can say that and you can speak it with authority because it's true. And so I want you to trust that and I want you to believe it. And in those moments, and I know, um, I, I remember this Muslim um, this Muslim sister, uh, I think Dr. Fatima Jackson, she was delivering the speech and she was saying she had gone through surgery. And she was like, one of the things when she was trying to come out of the anesthesia, one of the things her husband did to help wake her up is he began to recite um, recite, recite um, some of the Sora of the Quran. And she was like, even though she couldn't, like she was, she couldn't necessarily see. And she, she was like, but as she heard it, it began to, her brain began to work and she began to remember and began to speak it and say it. And so that's the thing. So being able to activate our muscles 
being able to speak wholly and truthfully um, about the power and presence of God is important. Um, we have to love ourselves enough to know that we are worthy. And, you know, sometimes the enemy sets up snares and traps for us to fall into. He can use the people we love. Just look at Joseph. You know, it's his brothers that set him up and left him for dead, you know, but we have to be able to love ourselves through it. And in that, that was like the perfect exhibition of forgiveness, you know? So he then gives his cup to Benjamin for to be brought back. But then when Jesus speaks of his cup, he's speaking of it in terms of suffering. So it went from favor to suffering, but there was favor even in his suffering because he was suffering for the sake of the atonement of all mankind. And when he ascended, he ascended, not just, you know, oh, he cool and he with the ancestors, but it's like, yo, you can call on me and I'll see that God hears you. You know, I'm that person, you know, and whether people agree or not or say that it's through Christ, but at the very least, the consciousness offered, which is to say that you have a right to live and die for your purpose and pursue it wholeheartedly. That's an amazing proclamation. That's an amazing proclamation. And you can do so freely without having to worry or compromise who you are. And so I just like to encourage you, if you're feeling sad and you're feeling depressed, you know, find, sit down and rethink, what's my purpose? Then when you find it, start practicing as much as you can, as much as you can, because you have a purpose. You have a purpose. And if you have nothing up, you live for your purpose. Live for your purpose. That's why it's so important. It's so important. It's so important because that's what protects you from idleness. And I'm not telling you that you won't be bombarded with intrusive thoughts because once you start living in your purpose, Satan wants to attack you. So Legion was the demon that was inside the man and was making him speak evilness and making him do evilness. And you have to cast you have to cast those out and you can speak to them. You can speak to them and give it and give it absolutely no power or authority over you um, abiding in your purpose because you have a purpose. You do. You do. You have an amazing purpose. And I love you and I appreciate you. God loves you and appreciates you. And for that reason, I just want you to be exalted. I love and appreciate you. God loves and appreci appreciates you. And I hope you would do the same for me. Um, and so that's that. But I also, I saw this interview with uh, Talib Kweli, Talib Kweli and um, Melanie Fiona. And it was dope because, one, I didn't know that Talib DJs. Um, and, you know, Melanie Fiona was talking about the Glow in the Dark tour when she went on with like Kanye, Kid Cudi, and she went through all these different people that she toured with. And she was saying like she was the only R&B artist and how it was so amazing to her. I'm telling you, Get into that space where you're in your purpose because it'll allow you to be in spaces where you may ordinarily feel absolutely uncomfortable, but the discomfort instead of depressing you will push you to be your best self. And I just want you to be your best self. I want to be my best self. I know that I need help and I know it's not easy to change your mind and change your behavior, but I believe in you and I think that you can do it. And so let's get those thoughts under control, under the dominion of the Most High God. You are beautiful. You are the best part. I love you. God loves you. And you're worthy. So you don't go nowhere, especially not on your own, not just because you don't mm -mm, you don't get to make that decision. We're dependent on you. And if you ever read The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, he says you have a purpose that God needs you to do. And I know that sometimes I like, get yeah, God is persistent about getting it done. So even if we don't do it, he's going to find a way to get it done. But it'll be best if you do it. It'll be best if you do it because it's a reason why he assigned it to you, because you have a special gift and aptitude that it won't come the same way if it came for somebody else. Now, it's God it's still going to be good and God because God don't make no junk. But you're beautiful and you're amazing. So take care of yourself. I love and appreciate you. Peace.